God says here now that he's going to gather all these people who have been bringing trouble into the land of Israel, his people. And he says, I'm going to bring them to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Whereas there is no such geographical place. Many scholars believe that this must be the place where King Jehoshaphat defeated an army that was a coalition of five kings that had come up against him. And he looked up and he said, Father, our eyes are on you. We have no salvation in any other place, but our eyes are on you. And the Bible says, for some very strange reasons, these kings and armies that had gathered against the King Jehoshaphat began to fight among themselves. And Jehoshaphat was up there worshiping and praising together with his army. They were not shooting any arrows. These people fought in that valley until they cleared themselves. I have always wondered, how did the last man die? <laughs> Must have committed suicide. <laughs> that is what God says he's going to do with the nations, the enemies. Because you have returned to me, this is what I am going to do. You may have a coalition of armies that have come against you. But when we look up to the Lord, God says, I am coming. And I'm bringing these people to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Joel lists some of the sins that the Gentiles had committed against the Jews. Scattering them among the nations. Selling them into slavery. Treating them like cheap merchandise. Joel assures Israel not to worry because God was going to deal with them as indeed in the days of Jehoshaphat. God is able to fight for us. When we have found ourselves in a place where we are oppressed, in a place where our pastor Juliet prays and says, why, oh God, are the people living in such squalor? Why can't people have decent housing? Why can't we have decent roads? Why can't we have decent water? Why can't we have decent this and decent that? Because there are armies, unfortunately, from within who have come and devastated the land. But God is saying they are going to be gathered in the valley of Jehoshaphat. There are other armies who have come from outside the land and they have been killing our people. But now God says, you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy, and no alien shall ever pass through here again. Hallelujah. God is going to bring revenge and salvation. We want to trust God that these prayers are not in vain. As we say, give me this mountain, our mountain is the mountain of Kenya. And we are saying, Lord, give us back our land. Raise up an army. Take these enemies into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And let them begin to fight among themselves. I don't know whether your eyes are open. Let them begin to fight among themselves. I won't say more than that. Then he talks about restoration of supplies. Restoration of supplies. He says in verse 18 of chapter 3, And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine. <laughs> Hallelujah. The hills shall flow with milk. And all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Acacias. Hallelujah. Now, because we didn't read chapter 1, you may not rejoice as much to this kind of information. What God is speaking through Joel 
you may not appreciate it until you read chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. In chapter 1, there was a biting drought. And even animals could not find pasture. The Lord now promises three types of refreshing drinks that will flow through the land. The first is a mountain flowing with wine. Wine dripping from the mountain. Can you imagine that? Now I know we are born again, so we don't know. You don't know what wine is. But wine is one of the most expensive drinks. The Bible says wine refreshes the soul. I'm not saying you go and get. So when he talks about wine is that people will now get into merrymaking. People will get into a place of rejoicing. People that had been devastated will get to a place that now they have parties. Hallelujah. And wine will be there in plenty. It is dripping from the mountain. I don't know whether you are imagining that in your house. Where you can now go and have a party with chapati. Not wine this time. That it will flow. But then he talks about the hills shall flow with milk. The cows had died. The cattle had died. But now milk is flowing from the hills. And then he says the brooks will be flooded with fresh water. This will be true times of refreshing for the people of God. He says that these are things that I'm going to bring. The call was there, return to the Lord. Let there be a solemn assembly. And he says now when this happens, this is what will happen. Because you have returned to the Lord. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, repent and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, I will hear from holy heaven and I will heal the land. This is the healing that we are talking about. That things begin to work. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, if you are a true child of God, God knows how to take care of you. Even though you pass through the valley of the shadow of death, he will come through for you at the right time. Dr. Jacob Gatias, a Jew himself and a gifted missionary to his own people, used to say, we Jews are waterproof and fireproof. God has blessed us so that nobody can successfully curse us and we shall be here long after our enemies have perished. Hallelujah. You can substitute the word Jew for Christian. We Christians are also fireproof and waterproof. Even though you pass through the waters, even though you pass through the fires, they will do you no harm. These are not just good words that we say on a, at a solemn assembly so that you can go home excited. These are the truths of God's word. These are the promises that God has made for us. These are the kind of promises that Caleb hung on to. And for 45 years, he hung on to that promise. Because God says, I am going to give you the land of Hebron. But Hebron was not coming for one day, for two days, for one year, for two years. For 45 years, that promise was never being seen. But Caleb hung on to that promise. Caleb hung on to that promise. And when the hour came, and he saw Hebron with his own eyes, the things of this world grew strangely dim. People were skewing for conquered land. Caleb said, give me this mountain. This is my promise. 
This is what God spoke to me 45 years ago. Brothers and sisters, unless you know the truthfulness and faithfulness of God in fulfilling his promise, you will be running around a headless kettle. I've never known how to say that thing. <laughs> but whatever they say it. Like a headless chicken. You do not know that God has made a promise for you. So you must hang on to the promises of God. And whatever is happening around you, say for the next 45 seconds, I'm hanging on to this. For the next 45 minutes, I'm hanging on to this. For the next 45 days, I am hanging on to this. For the next 45 months, I am hanging on to this. Even if it takes 45 years, I know God is faithful and he is able to do what he has promised because he is not man that he should lie. No son of man that he should change his mind. So has God said, I'm healed? Then I'm healed. Has God said, I'm blessed? Then I'm blessed. It doesn't matter what circumstances are showing around me. Caleb was there in the wilderness 40 years. And then they had gone into the promised land another five years. But he knew that what God promised me will come to pass.